So, there's this thing about building magic systems that we talk about a whole lot in fantasy world building. But in the equivalent, in the science fantasy realm, there seems to be somewhat of a gap around how to build technology that fits into your world. Technology that strikes your reader as believable. Technology that adds that element of fun, like when Ford turns into a penguin. Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. Today, I continue my video series on the topic of science fantasy world building. But this will be the start of a mini series within that series because I was going to just do one video on the topic of building technology for science fantasy. And then I got going and the script turned out to be somewhat longer than anticipated. So I have divided the series up into a little mini series. Now, if you want access to this kind of content immediately as I shoot and upload the videos, then you can become a member of my channel. And for seven euros a month, you will get immediate access to my content as I upload it, including much of the series which will already be up by the time I make the video public. You will also get some exclusive member perks like those listed in the information card. So, if you're interested in supporting this channel, do consider signing up for a YouTube membership. Now, enough of that. Let's crack on with building technology, starting with four principles to guide your way. Much like building a magic system in fantasy, there is a structured way to approaching building technology in science fantasy. At least that's the approach I took in world building for Magic Fall, which is the book that I wrote with my podcast partner, Drake, that is set in a science fantasy world. So, here are Marie's four principles for building technology in science fantasy. And yes, of course, they're not as famous as Sanderson's three rules for magic. But if you smash that like button, maybe someday they will be. Principle one, understanding. Your reader needs some little grain of science that they can accept as the explanation behind your technology. It doesn't need to be a deep understanding. No one is expecting a doctoral thesis here. It just needs to have a bit of jargon that makes sense if you skate across the laws of physics really fast. For example, Star Trek's warp drive relies on the concept of warping the space-time continuum to allow faster-than-light travel. And this is in keeping with Einstein's general relativity theory. Sort of. And how they introduce this to you is they're just like, it's a warp factor X drive. And that's all you know in the beginning of the series. And that is good enough. It's that little bit of a grain that tells you, this is the basis for my technology. See, I'm not just completely making it up. For a little bit more esoteric example of this, lightsabers in Star Wars are powered by kyber crystals that can hold the force. Now, there is very little science involved in lightsabers, but there is that little bit of a grain because we know that crystals do focus light. Crystals do pull light through and crystals can contain power. So maybe these crystals could exist and they could power our lightsabers and even the ray on the Death Star. When you're building your technology, think of what the science principles are that you are taking into your world. What is that little bit of a grain that you're feeding your reader, that crunchy bit of science goodness that will let them swallow down the whole fantasy role? Principle two, limitations and flaws. Like with your magic system, your limitations and your flaws are more interesting than just the flashy effects. So, what can't your technology do? 
What are its limitations? How does this impact the story or the society? Let's take a look at some examples. The improbability drive in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy can lead to wildly unpredictable outcomes, humorously playing on the theme of chaos and unpredictability. I mean, who can forget Ford being turned into a penguin? Now, of course, I'm cheating by bringing up Douglas Ad Adams, who is not just writing in science fiction, but also in satire, and thus can get away with things like the improbability engine. So let's, look at an, let's take a look at another example. In Stargate, we are introduced to the absolutely incredible chair defense technology that shoots these drones that take down any enemy airships that threaten Earth but they are powered with modules called ZPM, zero-point modules, which are a legacy of ancient technology. And there aren't a lot of these ZPMs. And this, finding an alternative power source or finding more ZPMs, becomes a plot driver in both Stargate SG-1 and in Stargate Atlantis, very much so in Atlantis. So you can definitely use the power source of your technology as your limitation, but you don't have to depend on it. There are other limitations. For example, you could lean on resource limitations. Star Wars limits lightsabers by limiting kyber crystal availability. And then you can also have a negative influence of this technology that isn't necessarily a limitation, but is an enormous flaw. And a great example of this comes from the Rifts role-playing game. In Rifts, there is this class called the Juicer, which is a combat class. Now, the Juicer is a superhuman. They are the result of some massive conversions to the body's natural be state of being. And the, it forces the body to process chemical enzymes, completely overstimulating the body and creating this super saiyan soldier that is so physically capable it can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with monsters. But a body that goes through the juicer's lifestyle only lasts five to seven years. So you're literally creating the super powerful soldier that can only stay alive another five to seven years before they bite the big one. So it is an enormous downside to this incredible upside of this chemical technology. And again, there's that little bit of that grain of truth pulling us through because we know that there are chemicals that can alter the body's performance. And so we're pulled into believing the juice's abilities, and then we're hit with this downside of you have five to seven years, and then eek. When building your technology, think of the limitations. Think of the flaws. Think of the impact it has on the person using it and on the society around it. And think how that limits its use. Okay, principle three, expansion and interconnectedness. Technology doesn't just leap fully formed from a scrap heap of discarded ideas. It builds on knowledge. It builds on previous discoveries. We stand on the shoulders of giants and all that. So in your world, rather than introducing new technologies randomly, rather than introducing a whole new paradigm, consider introducing technology that builds on new technology. This principle applies even when you are using alien technology or ancient technology or rediscovered technology. Stargate provides a great example of this. So we know that they have a energy problem and we know that these ZPMs have been introduced and so on. Then later in the series, we're introduced to a substance called Nakwada. 
they don't just take Nakwada and introduce us to like ZPMs or introduce us to a completely new power source or a completely new paradigm. What they do is they take Nakwada and then take a technology we're familiar with, which is to say generation of power generators, and they combine Nakwada with that. And as the series progresses, the Nakwada generators become better. So you have Nakwada generators Mark II and Nakwada generators Mark III. And the same thing happens in Star Trek with their spaceships. You have the warp drive factor 7, and then factor 10, and then factor who knows how fast they're going now, as fast as the plot needs them to go. And so you build on your technology, and that creates an interconnected landscape of one technology leading to another. My cat is very busy tonight. Very, very busy. Say hello, Darty. Tell the people they need to hit the like button. Use your little paw and smash a like button. Okay, principle four. Innovation. Do not be afraid to be innovative. Don't be afraid to push the boundaries here. This is science fantasy, not science fiction, not science research. You can go wild. You can combine your magic with your technology. In Magic Fall, I went ahead and introduced supersymmetry, which is from string theory, which, you know, pretty much everybody says really doesn't exist, but it's okay because I needed it for a fantastical power source, not a science fiction power source. And it really worked well for what I wanted the technology to do. And that was good enough. But the question of innovation brings up a very important and very interesting sub-element, which is in your world, who is driving innovation? Who builds out the boundaries? Who does the research? Who are your scientists? And the reason why I say it's interesting is because that is where you can tell amazing stories of science going wrong. For example, in the Warhammer 40k universe, which is a very stagnant universe where the technology is set and you're not supposed to research, here your, your guys who are pushing the boundaries are almost heretics. And so they have to hide what they're doing. They've got to do the research on the sly. And that leads them to sometimes make deals and go down really dodgy paths because they have no other options. And that makes for a great story. Even in Star Trek, which is much more science focused and where scientists have got, you know, status and so on, you have great universities that are pushing the boundaries. Sometimes to create technology, you need the cooperation of multiple races, like for the slipstream drive or the quantum drive. And in that case, the politics around that cooperation can form a whole story by itself, or at the very least, create a fascinating backstory and a historical reference point to a time when your one planet was allied with another planet, and maybe now they no longer are. Or maybe they still are, but their relationship is now strained over a fight of a new technology. So give some thought to who is doing the innovation in your world that are creating these marvelous brainchilds of your technology. And those are my four principles for creating technology in a science fantasy world. What do you think? Do you think they're useful? Do you think I missed anything? Let me know in the comments below. And now let's move along to talking about what powers this fancy technology you've just invented. Like the source of magic, the core source of advanced technology is perhaps the most important question you can answer in building technology. What is the energy that is at the heart of your ship's engines? What holds your floating city aloft? What powers your laser sword? How is it generated, stored? What is its impact on your society? These questions 
can seem like a stream of jargon hitting you in the mouth. Or it did me anyway when I was building for Magic 4. So let's break down those questions and build up some ways to approach answering them to create the technology at the heart of your world. The first question is how is energy generated in your world and what are the technological and societal structures that support this? Consider our very own world for this. We need electricity more and more each day. That power is generated from a variety of sources, coal-fired stations, nuclear stations, solar, wind, some experimental sources like tidal generation, and a whole plethora of other sources. Seriously, there are so many, many more than you would think. Heck, you can generate electricity by using a bicycle. You can make a generator by spinning magnets inside a coil of copper wire. And the magnet spins, and as the magnet spins, electricity is generated and runs into the coil of copper. And of course, you can make the magnet spin by pedaling, and that turns the kinetic energy that you're generating with the spinning into electrical energy. So we have a lot of options for generating power, but harvesting it and getting it to places where it's useful, that's a different matter. The power generated has to go into the grid, and only through the grid can it go to useful places, like powering the lights that are shining on me right now and letting you see me through YouTube. And grids are expensive, because you need to transport electricity using wires over sometimes enormous distances. And that's why the grid is such a large topic of conversation in our world. So even just using good old electricity, you can have an enormously complex energy situation in your world. And that's not even thinking about generating that electricity through new and fascinating ways, like tapping into black hole energy. Yes, create micro black holes and suck the energy out of those mini doomsday specks. What could possibly go wrong? I am Sorry. Let's take a look at some of the fantastical examples for generating and harvesting power. The Matrix offers a dystopian vision where humans themselves are the energy source harvested by the machines. This flips the traditional power dynamic and speaks to themes of exploitation and the essence of life. It's a really great bit of world building that puts the generation of power at the heart of the story. In my world of magic falls, I leaned into string theory, as I said, and introduced supersymmetry. So I built supersymmetry into my world, and then I was like, okay, so if I have this radiation, that supersymmetry radiation on this world, What is the effect on my fauna and flora? How do things evolve with this incredibly weird power so built into their world? And so my source of power for my world gave me a whole ecosphere of strange fauna and flora and creatures and weird things for my characters to interact with and for my readers to discover. And if you're interested in exploring that world, you can pick up a copy of Magic Fall on the links down below. Another question of your technology is, how do you store power? Now, if we look again at Star Wars, the ZPM devices store a great deal of power in these very small modules. And this turns ZPM modules into a strategic asset. They represent a pinnacle of lost technology that current civilizations can barely reproduce. And this underscores themes of legacy and the search for knowledge. In all the weirs of Pern, the people of Pern discover a friendly AI who they start to create power for, and they create chemical batteries. 
there are those in Pyrenees society who oppose this return of technology. And they attack these batteries as the source of power, which is a great metaphor for how those resistant to adopting new technologies would attack the thing that powers those technologies. Perhaps in your world, power is stored in crystals, or maybe in chemicals, or maybe you have balls of electricity that can be put inside a storage cupboard and taken out as needed. Whatever your storage device is, it doesn't have to be fancy, but you do have to think about how people will react to it. Will they attempt to attack it? Will they use it? Will it be valuable to them? Will it be like us in mobile phones that you have to keep thinking about when, it, when can you next plug your phone in to charge? Storage can make a lot of difference to a power source. So give some thought to how your power is stored and how people can move it around. And speaking of attacking energy sources, let's talk about accessibility and control. Who controls the energy? Is it a single powerful empire? Is it scattered independent planets? Or, or perhaps there's corporations that control it? If your society is dependent on power, the entity that controls that power holds the reins of your society. Think of the Matrix again. Control over energy became one of the core conflicts between man and machine. So don't forget to think about that in setting up your world's energy source. Who is actually in control of that power? And what does it mean for your story that they hold that control? And what happens if they exercise that control and cut people off from power? What is the effect on your society with the removal of that energy? How soon do those storage devices run out? And of course, you do have to think of sustainability and renewal, because the question of what happens when energy is depleted is a great plot point. It's not just if the person holding it chokes it off. What if people literally run out? Stargate Atlantis milked this one with the ZPMs. Man, they must have spent a whole season looking for ZPM module, uh, looking for ZPMs in order to power that city. And in Star Trek, you had dilithium crystals which couldn't be replicated, and thus the hunt for dilithium crystals also consumed large parts of the Star Trek early episodes. So even in the vastness of space, you can absolutely make resource scarcity still be a thing. And you can ask the question, what happens when it runs out and how do you renew it or find alternative sources for your power source? Much the same as your one dude exercising control and saying, no, your power is gone. You can have people saying, okay, but we're going to run out of this. What do we do now? We will talk more about resource scarcity and its importance in science fantasy world building later on in the series when we do economics in science fantasy. But for today, these are my thoughts on building tech and power in a science fantasy world. Show the power grid it can't stop you smashing that like button by, well, smashing that like button. And if you like this video, you might also like my video on fantastic metals. By the way, watching a second video really helps the channel grow because it tells our mighty overlord, the algorithm, that my channel is adding value. So please, do clicky right over there or right over there.